Hi, it's Roberta Glass, and today we're talking about Adnan Syed DNA, bombshell or shell game with Alexa. Stay tuned. So with us today to talk about the Adnan Syed bombshell is Alexa, once Adnan Syed's greatest supporter, now maybe one of his biggest critics. Thank you, Alexa, for talking with us about this stuff. Hi, thank you for having me. So what is the bombshell and how was it found? The bombshell is that There was DNA evidence finally tested, and it has all come back inconclusive. However, um, (laughs) Justin Brown is trying to claim that he's the one who tested it or was working with the state to test it or whatever, but that's not the case. Um, Whenever the conviction was initially overturned in 2016, the state thought, you know, maybe we're going to have to retry him. Let's test this DNA that we have and see, or let's test these items that we have and see if there's DNA on them. And hopefully, you know, it'll come back maybe some with Adnan. But it was, Adnan's had 20 years. <laughs> He's been in prison 20 years. He could have petitioned to have these items tested. They never did. It was the prosecution who did. And then it was the Baltimore Sun filed an MPIA request, like a Freedom of Information request, to get the results. And two pages of results were released a couple days ago that they tested um, some items. It was just like where her body was found, there was like some trash nearby. There was like a condom wrapper, a rope, quote-unquote. There was a liquor bottle. And they also, oh, they also had her fingernail clippings tested. And they just wanted to see if there was any DNA. But the only profiles that came back on anything were Heyman Lee's DNA profile, and everything else was inconclusive. Nothing excluded Adnan, but nothing included him either. It included nobody. Right, but they're presenting it. I've seen, um, who is Justin Brown, just so uh, the audience knows? Adnan's appellate attorney, his okay. current attorney. And I've seen, and also, the, I get them confused sometimes, Justin Brown, and who is <laughs> Colin Miller? <laughs> Colin Miller is one of the attorneys and uh, that is on the Undisclosed podcast with Rabia, it's, um, Colin Miller and Susan Simpson. And he also is a blogger. He does evidence prof blog and just another advocate for Admon. Okay. And, and so when it was released, it was presented as if this were information that was tested for the HBO and recorded by the HBO documentary, correct? Um, for the for Adnan's defense, there's a <laughs> little uh, you know there's a it the episode ends with them saying you know sending the DNA test right? the email yeah an email it shows like the episode episode three of the HBO documentary ends with showing Justin Brown in his office sending an email and it says um here's the request form for dna and then it goes to like a black screen like that's it just shows a real quick clip of his computer screen saying a request for dna and then it goes to black but when you look closely at it it is not there's nothing attached there's no form he's not requesting dna in the email it's to another lawyer in his office like someone down the hallway that like isn't even involved in the case like it's just another lawyer in his law office so like sending something in too that's not really a real request for dna (laughs) so probably what we could imagine happened not saying it did but hb we need a shot of you sending this uh (laughs) request to get the dna tested oh okay all right i'm just gonna open up the computer get the email (laughs) wait well i gotta wait who am i sending this to Oh, I'll just send it to, uh, what's her name down the hall? Romero. Yeah, it was like Lillian or something. Yeah, Lillian Romero down the hall. She'll, she'll get a kick out of this, and I'll just, what, 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 <laughs> she, what do you recall this? We'll just call it test. 
DNA, yeah, right? Yeah, the, the title of the, the email is just test. Right. And then it says, here's the DNA request form. He did not ever fight, like, when it, um, a serial happened, when serial is being recorded, um, they bring up the fact, Sarah Koenig brings up the fact that there is evidence that probably could be tested that never was for DNA. And Adnan says, I am afraid of nothing with my, he's being recorded. He says he's afraid of nothing with his case. And um, he would love to have the stuff tested, and he's happy to file something in court to have it tested. And Deirdre Enright of the Innocence Project was involved at that time, too, and, uh, you know, heavily pushed for this, hoping to find someone else's DNA. However, once serial was done being recorded, that was never filed in court, or if it was, it was immediately withdrawn. The defense never, it's been 20 years, they have never once filed to have this stuff tested, ever. Because and the, then there's a clip of Justin Brown talking about being scared of testing the DNA. Yeah, let's listen to that. Hold on. It's a little tricky, though, because DNA testing could be misleading. It's not disputed that Adnan was in contact with the victim. He's her, her former boyfriend. They remained friends after the, the two split up. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be at all surprising if his DNA were, you know, in her car. So we have been and we will continue to be really careful about DNA testing. Okay, so what's your reaction to that clip? I find it interesting that he trails off at the end when he's talking about it and how uh, you know, he's insecure about it. Like, he's like, Oh, you know, he was her ex-boyfriend. They remained friends. Of course, his DNA is going to be there. And notice he says, so we're, we have been careful, and we will continue to be careful when it comes to testing DNA. Like, he's preparing everybody, because probably maybe at this point he knows that the prosecution is going to test it, or maybe he's been told the prosecution is going to test it. And he's worried that Adnan's DNA could show up in it, and so... He's like, oh, you know, if it does, he, he was her best friend. He was in her car. You know, it could be there. It's But it's, it's a, a complete 180 from him now saying, I worked with the prosecution to test the DNA. Like, we have this bombshell. Like, for, he was fortunate enough to not have, you know, found Adnan's DNA because he wore gloves, like Jay said in the beginning. Yeah. But it, this is a complete 180 from him because this clip, the clip that you just played, is from 2016. This is before the results or anything have even come back. So he's so, you know, cautious about testing it, but now all of a sudden it's a bombshell. The bombshell that his DNA is not there. I mean, you should see both of them, Justin Brown and Colin Miller on Twitter. Now we know, now we have definitive evidence that Adnan did it. He's nowhere than, you know, he is absolutely, instead of the inconclusive DNA is being presented as, exclusive you know he is excluded Adnan point. is absolutely excluded when they also found his handprint is that correct on the map of Lincoln yeah, Park handprint or, or multiple fingerprints on the back cover of the map in her car in her and car. they make a big deal out of saying oh but his his fingerprints weren't on any of the pages well if you look in the trial transcript they didn't test any of the pages for fingerprints because of the, like, porous material is not something you can just get dust for print. So they weren't even tested. So don't say his fingerprints were there and they couldn't have, they, you know, didn't find any after searching. They specifically said we could not test the pages, but we could test the cover, and his prints are there. Wow. And also, and it, it the issue of gloves is also... It's not just a issue all of a sudden brought up by nons, but the theme of gloves ran all the way through this case. Can you explain? When I can't remember if it was Jay's the very first interview, I believe it was of either his first interview or second recorded interview with the police in 1999. He says that when he got to Best Buy, where Adnan had apparently strangled her, that he was walking around with gloves. And he even asked him, like, what, what the fuck are you walking around with these red gloves for? And Adnan even says it himself later. Like, when the cops arrest him, he claims that, you know, because Rabia asked him. She wrote in her blog. I have this thing in front of me. She wrote in her blog. Um, 
If Adnan threw the red gloves away before he got into the car and drove all around town as Jay testified, then why were his fingerprints not all over the car? I questioned Adnan about how he knew about the red gloves before they were mentioned or we were ever made aware of them. Adnan stated that when he was arrested, the police told him they knew about the shovels he discarded, the red gloves, and the phone calls. The, so the, he himself says that Jay, they told me, you know, Jay told us everything and he told us about the red gloves. Wow. These, these police are amazing. They know everything. They know where the car is at before Jay does, but they just sit they on that information. There. Correct, right? They, uh, they, they actually, they don't need Jay at all. They know about the gloves. They just, they let Ad, Adnan in on every part of his case because he knew nothing about it. But he, he, he knows. The, he, so, uh, there were several hours. I mean, Jay went on ride alongs with the police for hours and hours. Like, his testimony, you know, he had multiple interviews with them and told them uh, uh, millions of little details about the case and about what happened that day. And just one of them mentioned one time was about the gloves. But yet that's something Adnan brings up and claims when Robbie asked him, wait, how did you know about the gloves? And he's like, oh, the police told me. Okay, so the police talked to you because even by his own admission, they only talked to him for a few minutes that day and he didn't tell them anything. And then because he watched Matlock, he knew to ask for an attorney. And one of the things they mentioned was these red gloves, or Adnan is that you're worried about them knowing about these gloves. Like, it's in um, Serial, they play part of Jay, either they play part of his interview or she uh, states, like, from the, I think they play it, though, but this, these are Jay's words. He says, he started telling me about how it was when he killed her, how he had wrapped his hands around her and her throat. She started kicking. And he said he looked up to make sure nobody was looking at, in the car at him. And he said he was worried about her scratching him and getting his skin under any of her fingernails and that she was trying to say something. That almost makes me want to cry. And it is very disturbing to think about. And, like, later he says that uh, Adnan told him he thought that she was trying to say, I'm sorry, while he was strangling her. Like she was trying to apologize to him. It's it's very very troubling, uh, and it's very interesting that okay. So they tested the fingernail scraping, and it says the clippings, and it says they found her DNA underneath them, and then any other DNA profile they found was inconclusive. Now it does not exclude Adnan; it was inconclusive. So if they're strangling the life out of her, and obviously she's scratching and biting, she'll get their DNA under her fingernails. Unless maybe the person's wearing gloves, like Jay has said all along. How did he know in 1999 there was going to be no DNA found under her fingernails and that Adnan wore, or whoever wore gloves? I mean, it's, to me, the fact that there's no DNA found is almost even more damning because it gives more validity to Jay's statement. Because whoever strangled her must have wore gloves, right? Right. Yep. No one else's, uh, no other identifiable DNA came up. It was just her DNA and possibly someone else's, which could be anyone. Anyone. Right? Or someone else that she had dealings with. Something and else. And how is that exculpatory? I just don't understand how funny. It's not, if they didn't find uh, the serial killer's DNA under her fingernails, they didn't find Jay's DNA. They certainly didn't find Don's DNA under her fingernails. So why is the fact that they didn't find Adnan even close to being exculpatory? Like, if, yeah, first, I would certainly say if they found one of these people's DNA under her fingernails, it'd be, it would look great for the defense. It, but it, finding nobody's does not, like, I guess it helps a little bit that his isn't there, but like I said, it just, to me, makes Jay's story even more valid about the, the gloves. Right, and, uh, hold on. Okay. And, you know, as much as I find their, you know, tactics distasteful, I'm not surprised because this is something that they always do. This, you know, free ad non team. I was fooled by it for a long time. You know, it was multiple years that almost three years I was in the free ad non, you know, camp and over and over again. Though, now that I've, you know, seen the light and realized, you know, what they're doing, a lot of things come to mind. They, this is, you know, kind of like their MO. They, Robbie would always post cut off documents, like, 
before the transcripts were released by um, a couple redditors, uh-huh. the trial transcripts, she tra- first of all, she tried to sell them. If she could raise up, like, for every $10,000 that they would raise, she would release, like, one page. Wow. And when she would, I mean, it's crazy. Because they're but long. But when she would release. Yeah. What? Yeah, they're long transcripts. I mean, she would have raised millions had she kept that that pace, right? <laughs> she would have loved it. She could have yeah. gotten even another house. But she would post a document here or there, but it was always like a half document with something, uh, you know, cropped out of it. You know, something, because like maybe on half the page it'd be something that didn't look good for him. So she would just post half a page to make it, you know, just to be deceptive. Because like, see, you know, this person said this without putting, you know, the first sentence where they're like, I'm not trying to say, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. You like, see, this is what they said. And right, they, so quote them, say, so it looked like it meant the opposite. Of, I mean, it looked like it meant the opposite of what they really exactly. said. Exactly, uh-huh. yeah. So she would do that, and so always changing the stories. Like, when the time card thing first came out, well, first it was, of course, Jay did it. And then it was, oh, Don did it. But when the, the whole reason they came up with Don was because Susan Simpson noticed that his uh, employee ID numbers on his lens crafter's time card were different. And he was at two different stores, so that's, I mean, le- very likely why the number was different. But she made a big deal of it in her blog, but then also prefaced it and ended it with, I don't think Don is guilty of this crime. I just, the only reason I'm even bringing this up is because I feel like the cops should have looked into it more. But no, I definitely don't believe he's guilty. But then go on undisclosed, and try to make him seem guilty and go on this HBO documentary. I mean, the first, you know, couple episodes were clearly trying to make Don look as bad as possible, like he possibly did it. When this whole, you know, the whole time you've always said you didn't think it was him. So they just, you know, they do these things. Oh, the saying that Kathy was wrong about this day, you know, not her real name, Kathy, when she says they were, you know, her uh, Adnan and Jay were at her house and he was acting suspicious. They're like, oh, we have the documents. We had this you know, schedule from that day saying that, you know, there really was no conference because that's how she said she remembered the day. But she also said Stephanie's birthday, but they purposely left that out of the show that she said Stephanie's birthday. They said the only reason she knew that it was that day was because of this conference and then tried to make us believe without ever showing us this document, of course, it's never been released, that um, there was no conference that day. Like they actually knew and uh, they said Hay never called Adnan possessive in her diary. They said that multiple times when, yes, she did. And, um, oh, remember the Emron A? And Emron That's my a? favorite because that was a kind of thing that often West Memphis 3 supporters will give me an argument. They will say, for example, I lived in West Memphis at the time. You don't know. You don't know what it was like walking down the street and wearing black. You wouldn't know the (laughs) satanic panic. Do you know how many times I was charged with murder for listening to Metallica? Right. So I always say to them, what, were you in the courtroom? No, or did you just kind of sniff the injustice through the air? Um, But with this, the Emron H and the Emron, what was the other Emron? Emron R? A, Emron H and Emron A was a kind of insider in the know. Oh, well, you're just an outsider looking in on this case. If you knew the Adnan circle the way I would know it, you would know that th- you're confusing. There were two Emrons. And- Do you remember the Ann Brocklehurst to Bob Ruff? Um, yeah, can you debate? tell that story, the Emron story? I think we're well, I'm confusing the audience a little gosh, bit. Gosh, it's a bit, you know, because when I was, I haven't listened to it, to be honest, since. I became a non. Like, when I was a supporter, though, I was so into it. And that's when I listened to it. And I'm like, oh, Bob really got her, you know. But I specifically remember a big thing about, you know, Adnan A and Adnan H. And Imran he was H, saying. Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and, and, and Bob Ruff said, well, well, I'll clear that up with you. I'll show you the documents. Yeah. Yeah. And, he said, she said it's very, you know, she had like 12 points, I believe it was, 10 or 12 points as to why she believes Adnan is guilty. And one of them was, she said, his good buddy, Emron A or H, can't remember which one, sent the email saying, hey, he's dead, stop looking for her. Right. And sent that to her family. And Bob was like, whoa, 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 obviously you know nothing. 
because that he doesn't even know that Emron. He was good friends with Emron Blah and not this one. And so, you know, and she goes, oh, well, I've done, you know, lots of research on this, and I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never even heard this. And he goes, oh, I have the documents in front of me. I'll, I'll send them to you. And we've never Has seen that Has anyone ever document. seen those documents? No. Not that I know of. No. We've never seen the clearing up. If anyone has the clearing up the Emron documents, uh, documents, uh, please put them in the comments because I'd, I'd love yeah, to see I'd them. Yeah, I'd like to see them. And also, um, you know, we're not going to go through all the, we're not, this is not a, an episode about why Adnan is innocent or guilty. If you are interested in reading the transcripts, I will link to the transcripts. I will pin them in the comments. Um, section so you can uh, look at them look at them yourself and make up your own mind but what we're talking about is really how this is being presented to the American public as this exonerating DNA when it's inconclusive that was pushed for by the defense team because they're so sure in Adnan Syed's innocence that they had to have this DNA tested Right. When it is actually the opposite. Uh, right. I mean, it's the opposite when it was the prosecution who tested it. And after the Supreme Court of Maryland ruled that Adnan is not to have a new trial, and should he have the opportunity for a new trial, it would only, it would likely end in another guilty verdict. So, yeah, like, I love the one, I can't remember the exact quote, but the one um, judge saying, like, None of this negates his obvious criminal agency in this act. Like, he's very guilty. And Asia McLean saying this, like, it doesn't matter because everything points to him and only him. He's the one who had means, motive, and opportunity. He's the one who admittedly gave his phone and car to the person who later admitted to burying her body with him. I mean, it's no, there's no one else. But Adnan Sayed. And it really makes me so, like, I was not expecting that verdict to happen. And I, I really lost a lot of sleep after I realized the truth, thinking, you know, all this money that I donated to this murderer could literally, and that's helped him because it was, you know, his conviction was overturned at one point. I was like, he's going to get out of jail. And I mean, clearly I wasn't directly, directly involved, but I had a hand in, you know, it. And I'm so happy that the Supreme Court is not allowing this charade to continue because I would not want to have, you know, helped get this murderer out of jail. Right. And that, and that brings up a good point, which is what money can do when you have it in our justice system. If you, you can buy the best lawyers, the best appe appeal lawyers, the best investigators, um, and, and they always act like the, the defense is the underdog in these cases, like it's, like Adnan's case, the defense is the underdog. The state is working, like, do you know how, you know, busy their caseload is and how many hundreds of cases each, you know, assistant DA has on the books and how much, a little amount of money they have to go at it? Like, the, the defense is innumerably, you know, in a better position. Absolutely. And how many cases are solved by DNA evidence, homicide cases? Do you know? I what? don't know. I was looking into it when we started talking about this. I think it's and something I like found, four and a half percent, something like that. Yeah. Well, on um, it was a the government study it was like a something dot gov study that was it broke down each type of crime and you know like it was like rapes, homicides, burglaries, and the physical evidence that it's found collected and processed and used in each one. And under homicides, it was between 3.5 and 4.5% of homicides that have DNA being collected and used. Wow. Because we really have the CSI effect where we feel like DNA can solve every crime and definitively, correct? Yeah, like, it was like oh, wait, he didn't leave physical evidence and that means he must be in it. Like, oh, there's no physical evidence found. He must be innocent. Well, no, nobody's, it's not, it, it would be so different. It's crazy to talk about it like somebody else's, you know, physical evidence. Whoever did it left no physical evidence. So to pretend like Adnan couldn't have because there was no physical evidence is ridiculous. Whoever did it obviously left no physical evidence. There's no evidence pointing at anybody else but Adnan. 
Right. And, and and it brings us also to this HBO documentary, which I wonder if it has done more harm than good. Because the reaction that I'm seeing uh, quite often is, um, I wasn't sure if Adnan Syed was guilty or innocent before I saw the HBO documentary, but now I think he is guilty. So The tide has really turned with him. It's very, um, ha- like, it makes me happy to see it. Because it used to be a lot more people. I mean, what, back especially when I was firm in his innocence, that a lot of people, it seems like it was, it was very popular, like, I was looking earlier at the first, uh, the money they raised in the first campaign for him. They raised $219,000 back in 2016 for his defense. And, uh, today, uh, I guess in less than 24 hours, the, uh, GoFundMe that they've reopened is going to end and it's at $46,000 right now. Wow. That is, that is quite some difference. Quite some difference, huh? I really think that the more people find out about the case, the more they realize that the state did get it right. It doesn't mean they've never gotten it wrong, but in this specific case, when you look at the evidence, they, they got it right, and it's very heartening to see that people are getting this. I think so, too. This murder is where he belongs. Yeah, I, I think so, too, and I, I think also I wonder how much of this uh it seemed like it was timed with 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 um, the HBO documentary to release this, like to to keep interest in the documentary and to also push the Adnan is innocent narrative. But I think what we can learn from this, as true crime observers and just as human beings, which is to always look at the source material. Don't count on other people for the translation, do the actual hard work yourself and, and read the source, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Like, if you don't look into this any further and you just see a headline or read a quick mention, you're going to think, oh, my gosh, the, the state had the, or not the state, the defense had the DNA tested because they knew he was innocent and it's excluded him and this is great news. A red, <laughs> as they said in Making Murder, a red-letter day for the defense. But when you look just a little closer... And at the source documents, clear to see it's actually the opposite. Well, we are going to uh, at least keep a really close eye on everything that comes out of the free Adnan camp. And um, thank you so much, Alexa, for uh, talking with me about this. Thank you. I love talking to you about this case. Likewise.